Welcome to the Healthcare Compliance Pro's August 2016 Q&A webinar. My name is Derek Wayman. I am a Compliance Relations Tech here at HCP, and I will be moderating today's webinar. Today, we'll be presenting the top five compliance topics that we receive questions on. At this time, I'd like to have the presenters for today's webinar introduce themselves. Michelle Lyman is our Operations Manager. Hi, this is Michelle. As Derek said, I'm the Operations Manager here at HCP. I serve on the front lines in supporting our clients. Uh, you may have spoken to me if you have website management questions or questions about um, basic compliance issues. I'm also involved with some product and article development, so you may have seen some things that I've, I've written on the Insider Newsletter, and I'm just excited to be here today and uh, help with the uh, answers that you're looking for with the, the questions that you may have about compliance. Thanks, Michelle. Chad Schiffman will also be presenting today. Chad is our Compliance Specialist Manager. Yeah, hi, this is Chad. A lot of you have worked with me as well. Um, I'm the Compliance Specialist uh, Manager here at HCP. I consult with clients on their compliance issues, contribute to insider articles, product development, probably help several of you with the security risk analysis, um, answered some of your questions, and my background is in healthcare informatics and administration. Great. Thanks, Chad and Michelle. At the end of today's presentation, we will be hosting a short question and answer session. If you have questions come up during the webinar, please post them using the GoToWebinar dashboard so that we can address them during the Q&A segment. Now I'll turn some time back over to Chad to introduce today's topic. Great. Thanks, Derek. During this webinar, we'll be uh, discussing the five compliance questions that we've received this year. These are actually the top five questions that we've received, um, and your handout should include these five questions with some tips as well. Um, with those, we're going to discuss managing business associates, HIPAA regulations for access to deceased individuals' medical records. I've had several questions on that topic lately. Disposal of safety syringes and recap needles, such as can you dispose of them in the trash? Um, biomedical waste management, including where is our biomedical waste plant stored? And also medical assistant credentialing, that's one that continues to come up, so we thought we should address that during this webinar. Great, thanks. We will also respond to the top questions asked during the webinar as part of our Q&A session. Answers will be provided at the end of the webinar or in an email response, depending on the time and complexity of the question asked. And answers will also be published in the Compliance Insider next week. Let's move on to our first topic. And our first topic today is managing business associates. So Chad, what is the definition of a business associate and who are my business associates? Well, first of all, we have received several questions from clients regarding uh, how-to instructions essentially on managing their business associates. And, and generally, the first question they ask is, you know, sometimes I struggle to know who is my business associate and if I should have a business associate agreement with that person. So remember, a business associate is a person or entity that performs certain functions or activity that involve the use, such as creating, storing, or modifying PHI, or disclosure of PHI on behalf of the, of the covered entity. That's really critical for uh, organizations to be aware of. Okay, and how should I be managing the relationship with my business associates? I'll help with de this one, Derek. Um, the participants who are on the webinar today who are currently using our services can go to an office within their HCP program and click on the Forms tab. And within the Forms tab, they'll find uh, a couple of documents that will be very helpful for them. The first one is called the Business Associate Decision Making Matrix. So you can find this uh, by doing a keyword search. You can just type in Business Associate, and you'll find several forms, including this Decision Making Matrix. And this will help you make that determination as to who exactly are your business associates. And then there's also a spreadsheet in that same area. It's an audit spreadsheet to help you track your business associates, just to make sure that you know who those business associates are and um, whether or not you have an updated agreement with them. And uh, those forms should give you a good head start in, in managing the, the business associates and that relationship. 
Yeah, and you know, speaking of the audit spreadsheet, it's really critical to review those associate agreements and update them as needed. Uh, we recommend making sure that there's language in there that safeguards, safeguards you as a covered entity. Um, and, and we'll talk about that here in just a few more minutes. Uh, I think Michelle had some more topics she wanted to talk about first. Yeah, I also wanted to just mention that once you get those business associate agreements updated, uh, you can use the website to upload those BA agreements uh, and archive them so that it's easy for you to manage them. And if you have any questions about how that process goes, how to upload those business associates, excuse me, business associate agreements on the website, um, I would suggest that you either reach out to myself or your uh, client relations specialist. That person would be able to uh, give you some some great tips as to how to use the website to best manage those relationships and uh, especially with making sure those agreements are on file. Great, thanks. Let's uh, move on to our next topic. Oh, did you have anything else to say, Chad? Yeah, I actually just wanted to go back to real quick to talking about the business associate agreement language. Um, it's very critical to include that you ensure that breach notification processes are included in your BA agreements um, and that they're easy to understand for both you as a covered entity and for the business associate. Um, for example, you want to make sure that your timeliness of notification language is clear in that. We've had some several issues with that lately to where we've received questions, you know, business associates want to say you need to do certain things with their agreement versus ours and they will actually delete the breach notification language. Um, it's important to remember for covered entities that including that language in there helps you in the event of a breach because uh, remember you the covered entity is going to be held responsible by OCR um, not the business associate with whom you have the agreement with so at the end of the day that's very critical so I just wanted to make sure they understand that and that it's also addressed within your policies and procedures all right, great. Well, let's move on to our next topic. HIPAA regulations for access to deceased individuals' medical records. How long does HIPAA maintain privacy rights for deceased individuals? Well, I'll, I'll take the first part of this question in that uh, the individually identifiable health, identifiable health information um, of a descendant is protected for 50 years under HIPAA, um, and that's following the date of death of the individual. Now, during that 50-year period, personal representatives um, of the descendant have the ability to exercise rights under the privacy rule uh, with regard to that person's health information, the descendant person, um, such as authorizing certain uses and disclosures, access to that information, and those types of things. We'll get into a little bit more of the specifics here in the next few minutes. All right. And who can a covered entity release the medical records to? I'll answer that one, Derek. I think it's it's very interesting. This is a, a very stressful question because um, you know you're imagining yourself at the front desk and you have someone coming up to you and asking for the uh, medical records for a, a deceased person who was uh, seen by your your practice. And so um, this is this is one that we we get this question quite often. And this is. Um, the information that I'd like to share on that today. So just understand that the privacy rule does permit you as a covered entity to disclose relevant protected health information for that deceased person to family members or other persons who have been involved in the individual's health care or payment for their health care prior to the individual's death, even if they are not personal representatives. And this permission is in effect unless doing so um, is inconsistent with any prior expressed preference of the deceased individual that is known to you as a covered entity. So if they've um, put something in writing, if they've ex expressed their desires for certain individuals not to have access to their information after their death, then you have to still uh, maintain um, that agreement with, with them. Um, and, and it's also important to note that while the privacy rule generally protects a decedent's health information, to the same extent the rule protects health information of living individuals, it also does a number of special disclosure provisions that are relevant to these deceased individuals. And so, for example, I just wanted to bring up that you as a covered entity may always use or disclose um, this information for research purposes. Um, so if, if, if that's been requested of you, you can uh, 
release that information as long as it has been de-identified. And what if the patient dies without naming a personal representative? So if, if that does happen for federal regula regulations, the covered entity can disclose the medical records to family members who have been involved in health care payment. Um, and even if they aren't named as personal representatives, as, as Michelle discussed. Um, but if they do die without naming a personal representative, you should check with your state laws to determine who has those rights. Often in state laws, uh, you will see, you know, the rights are typically go to an adult of the immediate family member. Some state laws, you know, require to submit proof whether you actually have the right to access that, you know, um, and a copy of the person's, person's death certificate. So it's very critical to check with your state laws. Um, another example is other states like to follow a hierarchy of who becomes by default the personal representative uh, of a deceased person. Um, and that's always the case in the event that someone dies without naming a personal representative. So those are the things that we t will typically answer in our responses to our clients. Thanks, Chad. Let's move on to our next topic. Disposal of safety syringes and recapped needles. Can we use biohazard bags instead of sharps containers for safety engineered devices such as capped syringes, self-sheathing needles, and vacuum tube blood collection systems, etc.? And this is one that we, we get a lot also because there's some confusion as to what can go in a bio, biohazard bag and what has to go into the sharps containers. So both OSHA and the FDA recommend placing all needles and other sharps in the sharps disposal container immediately after they have been used. So just keep in mind that that's both from OSHA and the FDA. And we also recommend that um, all items that are classified as sharps uh, should be placed also right after use immediately into the puncture resistant leak proof sharps containers, so approved sharps containers. Now also think about other items like the retractable lancets. Uh, these are also considered sharps and should be disposed of in the sharps container. Uh, and even though retractable syringes are designed to help protect against accidental sticks, um, they aren't designed to keep the syringe covered if the device is crushed. So keep in mind that even though they are designed to be a protected sharp, they still need to go into that sharps container for proper disposal. Yeah, Michelle, I'm going to go ahead and add a little bit to that as well. Um, I want to emphasize, you know, whatever you do, do not throw, do not throw away contaminated sharps in the regular trash period. Uh, you know, you're, whether it's OSHA, whether it's the state, you were going to run into several issues with uh, violating the law, really, and you can't dispose of those contaminated sharps in regular trash, period. Um, now, we have heard some conversation regarding disposing of sharps in medical, bio, medical waste bags. However, our recommendation is always to use that sharps container if, indeed, there's any question. Um, that's the best way to assure you're not going to run into any issues. And, you know, it's typically not uncommon for sharps disposal companies that actually require the sealed sharps containers, you know, the disposable sharps containers to actually be placed within a red biohazard red bag. Um, and then at that point, you could put those sharps containers, which are considered full, which means usually no fuller than the three quarters lines on the boxes. Some organization or some different vendors will have them, you know, to where it's even half. but. Generally, it's three quarters full, and, and at that point, they're ready for disposal. And that's a good point, Chad. Um, you just mentioned to uh, check to make sure what is okay as far as the full mark. So I, I thought I might add that it's important to check with your local or your designated disposal company. They may have more stringent disposal requ requirements than OSHA. So just make sure that you're uh, abiding by the OSHA standards, but also that you're meeting the standards for the vendor that you're using to take care of your disposal of, of biohazard um, safety syringes and recap needles, etc. in your uh, sharps containers and biomedical waste bags. And we did actually have a question come in. Um, someone's asking about IV catheters. Uh, they don't have a needle in them, however it was in the patient's body. I'm assuming they're wondering if how to 
dispose of those. Do you have an answer for that one? I, I, I can go ahead and take it. That's it's where your red bag should come into place for you on those. Um, from what we've seen on IV catheters, typically, that's where they would have you dispose of those. Great, thanks. And we'll move on to our next topic. Biomedical waste management. Is biomedical waste addressed within our training? If so, where is our biomedical waste plan located? So let me start with just to um, kind of go over what the law has to say about regulated waste and biomedical waste, and then we'll get into where those um, that information is addressed within your training. So OSHA states that the employer must train each employee who may be sub subject to occupational exposure. So that's important to keep in mind. And then that training on the regulated waste management, including that biomedical waste, must be provided at no cost to the employee and during working hours. Um, we have had uh, clients who have said, you know, we, we don't have time to provide this training during working hours. Uh, and so what they've done is made sure that those uh, staff members who couldn't complete the training during working hours were compensated uh, for the, the time that they took uh, off-site, whether they're training at home or, or during non-working hours, um, to complete that training that they were compensated uh, to meet those fed federal regulations. Yeah, and I'll go ahead and expand on the training just a little bit. Um, it's important to know that it doesn't that your training includes an explanation of your actual exposure control plan. Um, and that means employees need to know where they can obtain a copy of their plan. Uh, now, in the event of an OSHA audit, what we've seen is they will walk into the front desk, grab the receptionist, and say, hey, do you know where your written hazard communication plan is? Can you show me it? Um, and that's one of the first things they'll do, depending on, depending on the inspector. And we just want to let you know, though, that your OSHA training map module does include that uh, the requirements that are set forth by OSHA. However, however, there have been unique circumstances to where we've had to add additional language to say you need like a state requirement or something like that that might be a little bit more stringent or you know if your state has your own OSHA plan you may might have to be required to create a state specific biomedical waste plan and in most it, cases, we can certainly help you with that regard. Um, but generally, all the information you would need was right contained within that OSHA module, including your biomedical waste plan. So. Perfect. All right, great. Well, let's move on to our final topic. O uh, MA credentialing. In addition to medical assistance, which other employees should be credentialed? I'll go ahead and answer that first question. Um, so as of January 2013, basically what CMS came out and said is only credentialed medical assistants should be permitted to enter laboratory, medication, and radiology orders into the EHR. Now, it's important to note that by saying only credentialed medical assistants, they were talking about any medical assistant who wouldn't have been credentialed before. Some of those medical assistants who may have been working within an organization and didn't have to get certified at, at, per state requirements, say, or didn't have the actual certification from another organization. Um, so they came out and said, okay, well, you need to have a way to credential these medical assistants. And they also said that if a staff member of your eligible provider is appropriate credential, and performs assisted or similar assistive services as a medical assistant and carries a more specific title, um, you know, such as your lab technicians, your uh, pharmacy technicians, people like that, um, they, in their specialty, basically they can go ahead and be credentialed as well and they, they can in turn use the CPOE function in the Certified Electronic Health Record. Um, and that, or C or HRT, you'll see that abbreviation as well. What activities does credentialing enable an individual, such as a non-certified MA, to perform? I'll help with that one. Again, let's make sure that we understand what a non-certified MA is. A non-certified MA is going to be someone who performs those, those duties in your organization, but they have not gone through a, a formal course of study and you have then credentialed them by giving them a, a 
a test and uh, some training uh, so that they meet the the regulations that Chad was reviewing the computer computerized physician order entry or CPOE and then um, once they are credentialed that medical assistant or the staff member who performs those similar assistive duties can do three things the first is that they can enter laboratory medication and radio excuse me radiology orders into the CEHRT or certified electronic health record technology the second item that they can participate in is that they can uh, evaluate clinical decision support intervention or CDS intervention and then they can also make changes to orders based on that CDS intervention or bypass the intervention so basically they are going to be able to enter orders and evaluate the clinical decision making what competencies should the MA credentialing training test for I can go ahead and answer that portion um, basically by completing certain sections within a training it allows you to do the functions of a credentialed medical assistant and some of those uh, functions include the electronic health information you need to study uh, clinical decision support histories vital signs uh, we have communicable communicable diseases infectious diseases uh, you need to be able to order schedule laboratory testing for the CMS recommendations order schedule radiology exams uh, pharmacology referrals these are all things that should be bundled into a training and in fact the training that we've actually set up does include that so we made sure that the, that took all of those into consideration to ensure that the medical assistants or those staff with assistive duties that are similar to a medical assistant can complete the training and, and be a credentialed medical assistant and I might add that uh, we do carry this course within our uh, our offerings and so if you do have medical assistants or other uh, individuals who are handling those same sorts of responsibilities that that is a course that you can order through your um, your subscription to healthcare compliance pros all right so let's move on so if you notice you have a handout over on the dashboard and I would ask uh, Michelle would you mind going over the five things to do now sure let's just review the handout and then once we're done with that we'll go into our Q&A session and if you have any questions that pop up uh, as you're as I'm reviewing these five things that you need to do now go ahead and continue adding them to the to your dashboard and we'll address them momentarily so the first thing we would suggest that you do now is to ensure that you have that BA agreement with any entity who does the following who creates stores modifies or discloses PHI on behalf of your organization so you really need to know who your business associates are and the second thing that we would encourage you to do is consider adding language to your policies and procedures in regards to uh, release of information for deceased individuals uh, we would suggest that you look at your policies and procedures within your training and make sure that uh, if you need to beef up that up, um, language uh, you do so so and that's something that we can help you with if you if you want to go ahead and, and add that additional language the third item is to see to it that sharps containers are never overfilled Chad uh, covered this within our webinar uh, just make sure that you know what the fill level is allowed to be and then verify the required disposal procedures for those sealed sharps containers with your local waste management company and then the fourth item would be to make sure that all employees are trained on the location of your biomedical waste plan and just an FYI it is included in your OSHA training uh, through HCP and then the final item that we encourage you to do now is to ensure that those medical assistants or anyone who performs assistive duties similar to those of a medical assistant are properly credentialed all right well, let's go ahead and move on to our Q&A we will now answer any questions you've typed in during the presentation if you do have any additional questions type them in now any questions that we are not able to answer will be fielded in an upcoming insider newsletter so Derek I'll take the question that came through um, can certified x-ray techs enter orders 
And I would say that the answer to that is yes, because that individual has a certification, and because of that certification, they can enter orders into the certified electronic health record. Would you agree with that, Chad? Yes, I, I absolutely agree with that. And, I, and there's actually been some uh, clarification from CMS on that. So basically, with regard to CMS requirements, they can absolutely do that. Um, let's go ahead and just kind of branch off of that one, if, if we could, since someone also asked, can a staff member who has not gone through an MA program still be credentialed? Um, and the answer to that is yes, for CMS purposes, they can absolutely be credentialed as long as they, they take a course that does so. Um, the one thing to remember is a lot of MAs, you know, we've seen where they've worked up to the ranks or whatever, been just working for an office for a long time. Those are like an ideal candidate for the medical assistant credentialing course. So are the ones who might be new into the field and are just uh, an MA by default or may have not completed their certification yet but are working on it. They can, they're more than welcome to take the MA credentialing course. And, and in fact, even if you want your MAs who are certified to take the MA credentialing course, that's fine as well because we do require they we do make sure to cover all the CMS requirements that we're set for. So it's not a bad idea for even your certified ones to take it. Um, it's a good refresher course. I, I'm sorry. I, w I was just going to go off with with that Perfect. same um, <laughs> that same uh, try train of thought, I see that there's another uh, question that came in and, and I'll go ahead and read this one and then we'll go ahead and answer it. So this one says, will with credentialing a non-certified medical assistant, um, this individual was under the impression that as an organization the non-credentialed MA needs to be credentialed with an outside agency. And saying this, uh, sh this individual thought that they could not use the HCP training. So when it mentions outside agency, it's talking about you as a covered entity. You are the agency. You can go to an outside agency, such as HCP, to seek credentialing. And so since we do have that course, if you're using our, our program, if you're subscribed to our services, then you can use our training as that outside agency uh, representative uh, who's going to then credential your your non-certified MAs. Great, so we did have a couple questions come in. Uh, people are wondering if this is a one-time thing with the MA credentialing or how often do MAs need to be re-credentialed. Um, just kind of go into the time frame for that just a little bit if you wouldn't mind. Well, yeah, we can do you want to, kinda... yeah. Yeah, let's go ahead and have a discussion a little bit back and forth about that because I think both you and I have received several questions on this and have answered it mm -hmm. the same way. Um, however, there is some stuff, you know, obviously with this credentialing requirement came about with meaningful use. Um, that's when we first really learned of it. Um, there was some talk of, about it even before meaningful use. However, when it really was a focus was at that time. And then now with everything going to MIPS, well with the macro regulations regulations and MIPS, um, there's been some discussion as well will it still be required? And our answer to that and from what we can gather in the you know, because currently the final rule has not come out, it's only been the proposed rule, is that yes, it will still be a requirement under macro, it's just going to be bundled in under, under one of the objectives. Because um, remember, meaningful use, I, this is going to be covered in a whole other webinar, so I don't want to go into too much detail on it, but meaningful use will basically be absorbed into the MIPS program, um, basically into the macro regulations. It's not really going away, it's just getting changed or incorporated to where it's a little bit more streamlined for all your organizations <laughs> and being called something else. So. Um, that will still be required. So what we're going to say on that is we recommend retraining when MACRA and MIPS comes out because the module will be updated to reflect that. So um, as soon as 2017, it would be a good idea to recredit. I, I agree. I think that's exactly right. 2017 would be a, a great time to recredential your MAs. But keep in mind that the original uh, ruling never came out with a requirement to re-credential. It didn't say that 
the training only lasted a year or that they needed to read credential in two years. Uh, so that becomes just something that you can handle at this point. It, it's been something that you can handle in in house and say, well, they did take this course, but we believe it's a good refresher course, and we're going to encourage uh, those individuals to take it on an annual basis simply because we want them to have that refresher training and be up to date on on the things that we want them to be aware of in in handling those duties. All right, great. Yeah, well, it looks like we're just about out of time. I do see there's a few more questions, but like I said, those will be fielded in an upcoming Insider newsletter, or you will receive an email. And we would definitely um, like to think. Do you oh, think you we have? have I, yeah, yeah I, there is one that I think is really important to answer. If I could just really fast, because it's a real quick question, and then yeah, I'll absolutely. go ahead and send her an email as well. The one talking about a business associate agreement without uh, end date on it. Um, I want everybody to understand, you know, a lot of business associate agreements, and most of them include, well, when will the relationship terminate? And instead of having an actual end date, you'll have language like, when the business associate or vendor no longer has access to that information, the relationship ends. Um, you know, it, we recommend just reviewing your business associates agreements at least once a year, making sure that the language is current, and in the event that there are any changes within your organization, your policies and procedures, or their policies, policies and procedures that could impact the way PHI is safeguarded, at that point it would be a great idea to update that form. Great. Thanks, Chad. So, as I said, we would like to thank you for joining us today for our Q&A webinar. This webinar will be recorded and published in next week's Insider Newsletter. Our contact information is included on this slide, so please feel free to contact us if you have any questions. Make sure you stay with us long enough to complete our feedback survey at the end of the webinar, and watch for announcements for future webinars, which are generally held the second Thursday of each month. Thank you for joining us, and have a great day.